conversation. There is also a second reason. Part 3. Tongue talking in the new dispensation. There is also a second reason for tongues continuing in today's dispensation, and that reason is covered in 1 Corinthians 12-14. Before we look at that text, let us look at the Lord's Supper, since Paul addresses it just before he talks about tongues, see 1 Corinthians 11. In Israel's program, God instituted an annual Passover meal. Just before Jesus went to the cross, he gathered his disciples together and said, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, Luke 22 verse 15. Note that Jesus did not say, Lord's Supper, he said, Passover. Passover was a feast instituted for Israel in their program. When God set Israel's program aside, God appeared to Paul and revealed to him the mystery doctrine for the new dispensation, Ephesians 3 verses 2 to 5. Included in this doctrine was that they should come together and partake in the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 17 to 34. Basically, God took the Passover meal of Israel's program and changed it into the Lord's Supper for the new dispensation. Similarly speaking, when God started the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts 9 verse 23, he continued spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1, including tongues. For the Jew in the dispensation of grace, tongues served to provoke him to jealousy so that he may believe the mystery gospel and be saved, Romans 11 verse 11. For saved people in the dispensation of grace, tongues serve the purpose of communicating sound doctrine to believers, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 27. Therefore, just as God took the Passover of Israel's program and changed it to the Lord's Supper in the dispensation of grace, God also changed the purpose of tongue talking in the new dispensation. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 lists eight spiritual gifts in order of importance and diversities of tongues is listed dead last. The reason is because speaking with tongues in and of itself does not edify the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. That the church may receive edifying, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5. Let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13. In Acts 2, speaking in tongues was done to communicate the things of God to those who understood those tongues. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God, Acts 2 verse 11. In the dispensation of grace, the tongues spoken were unknown, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2. Therefore, an interpreter was required in order to understand what was said in the unknown tongue, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 28. Then, a prophet had to say if the interpretation was of the Lord or not, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37. This means that, while tongues were used to communicate sound doctrine in the dispensation of grace, it took three gifts, one, tongues, two, interpretation, and three, prophecy in order to communicate that doctrine. This is why Paul said that he that prophesieth is greater than he that speaketh with tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5, because the prophet could just speak the words of the Lord without the gifts of tongues and interpretation being needed, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 24. Thus, in the dispensation of grace, tongues are a very poor gift, which is why it is listed dead last in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28. So, you may say, why did God give tongues to the grace dispensation at all? In addition to tongues being a sign for Israel, Romans 12 verse 6 says that the gifts of the Spirit differ according to the grace that is given unto us. Grace is given. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, Romans 12 verse 3. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. Therefore, the more you read and believe God's word, the more faith you have, and the greater the spiritual gift that the Holy Ghost can give you. If everyone is at the level of prophet, tongues and interpretation of tongues are worthless to the church, because everyone can speak what the Lord says in the language of the people, without having to speak in an unknown tongue, have it interpreted, and then have it verified as being from the Lord, 
1 Corinthians 14 verse 24. The problem is that there are some believers who are not spiritually mature enough to prophesy because they do not have enough sound doctrine built up in the inner man. Therefore, God starts them out with tongues, then they move up to interpretation, and then they move up to prophecy. Since the Corinthians were carnal, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3, many of them had not advanced past the tongue-talking level. They were using their tongue gift in a fleshly way because they would talk over each other in their tongues to try to show who was the most spiritual. Much like the church I grew up in did. This is why Paul had to tell them that, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, 1 Corinthians 14 colon 27 28. In other words, tongues, by themselves, are worthless to the church. They produce no edification. So, no one should talk in tongues unless someone can interpret them into the common language of the people. Funny how Pentecostals point to 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 as their biblical authority for speaking in tongues today, yet they usually ignore this rule. Also, note that the other two times when Paul speaks of spiritual gifts, Romans 12 verses 6 to 8 and Ephesians 4 verse 11, tongues and interpretation of tongues are not even mentioned. Also, Paul spends very little time in those epistles on spiritual gifts, showing their lack of importance in the dispensation of grace. The gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues are like trying to have a five-year-old kid help out at a construction site. The kid is essentially worthless, but you may give him very small tasks because he can learn from them. If he handles them responsibly, he can gradually handle greater tasks until he can be a functioning adult on the job. Similarly, new believers are not able to edify the church with sound doctrine because they have not proven themselves to be faithful with the doctrine that they know yet. So, God gave the gift of tongues until that person's measure of faith grows to the point where he can interpret. Then, once his measure of faith grows, i.e., he has more sound doctrine built up in his inner man, he can prophesy and edify the church with sound doctrine. In the meantime, hanging around, so to speak, with the gift of tongues helps the new believer understand the things of God until he can handle those things, just like the five-year-old kid begins to understand the things of the construction site even though he is of no practical use there at his young age. Therefore, rather than being a sign of spiritual maturity, tongue talking was a sign of spiritual immaturity. This is why the Bible never records someone praying to receive the gift of tongues. This gift was automatically given to a new believer, since it is the least of all spiritual gifts, and everyone received a spiritual gift back then, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7. When tongues first appeared on Pentecost, the 120 gathered in the upper room did not pray for tongues. They did not even know what they were. The same thing happened when Gentiles first received the gift of tongues. They simply believed the gospel, and then they spoke with tongues, Acts 10 verses 44 to 46. When Paul laid his hands on followers of John the Baptist, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and prophesied, Acts 19 verses 4 to 6. Not once does scripture record someone praying to receive the gift of tongues. It happens automatically. Yet, Pentecostals sometimes spend many hours praying for the gift of tongues, showing that they are not receiving the gift of tongues as defined in scripture. Since the Corinthians were carnal, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3, most of them spoke in tongues. This is why Paul only speaks about tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, whereas he does not speak about tongues to more advanced believers, such as the Thessalonians. These three chapters are lauded by Pentecostals as proof that everyone should be speaking in tongues. However, these three chapters teach just the opposite. 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 Now that we have introduced tongue talking in the new dispensation, let us go over what Paul says about tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. 1 Corinthians 12 Paul introduces the topic by saying, Now concerning spiritual gifts, 
Brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1, which shows that they were ignorant, even though many of them spoke in tongues, as is evident from 1 Corinthians 14. Pentecostal churches today are the same. A basic outline of the three chapters is as follows. 1 Corinthians 12 All spiritual gifts need to work together as individual parts work together in a body. 1 Corinthians 13 Charity is the goal of all spiritual gifts and will replace them in the future. 1 Corinthians 14 Prophecy is better than tongues. In 1 Corinthians 12 verse 2, Paul says, Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. This sure does sound like the Pentecostals today, who are carried away to follow after dumb idols or false doctrines, instead of having Christ live in them. 12 colon 4 says that there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, while 12 colon 7 says that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. This means that every believer receives a spiritual gift. 12 colon 8 dash 10 then lists the gifts of 1. Word of Wisdom 2. Word of Knowledge 3. Faith 4. Gifts of Healing 5. Working of Miracles 6. Prophecy 7. Discerning of Spirits 8. Diverse Kinds of Tongues and 9. Interpretation of Tongues 12 colon 15 17 says that all members of the body of Christ need to work together. 12 colon 24 dash 25 says that God hath tempered the body together, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. What this tells us is that members of the body need to work together in using their spiritual gifts for the edification of the body. Therefore, if spiritual gifts are still in operation today, why do we not see all gifts working together? In other words, if the Pentecostals are correct that the gifts are in operation today, why do we not see someone give a word of wisdom, another person give a word of knowledge, another person have faith in these words, another person heal people of physical ailments, another person work miracles, which is different from physical healings, another person tell us a word from the Lord. Another person discern if a person has a spirit of a devil or the spirit of God, another person speak in tongues, and another person interpret tongues. Instead, Pentecostals concentrate on speaking in tongues, being slain in the spirit. The Bible never mentions someone being slain in the spirit, interpretations, and physical healings. The point is that, even if spiritual gifts are in operation today, there does not appear to be any church that uses them properly, functioning together as members of a body, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. Therefore, even if tongues are for today, Pentecostal churches are in need of a major overhaul in order to use all of the spiritual gifts, not just tongues. 1228 also says that God's order of importance of the spiritual gifts is 1. Apostles 2. Prophets 3. Teachers 4. Miracles 5. Gifts of healings 6. Helps 7. Governments and 8. Diversities of tongues Again, where is a such a structure found in churchianity today? Apostles are ones sent by God. How would we even have apostles today since God does not supernaturally ordain apostles today? Prophets speak what the Lord says. How would anyone receive a supernatural word from the Lord today when God's word is completed? Colossians 1 verse 25 We do have teachers today, but all teachers have to study to be approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 No one is given the words by God to teach to others without studying. Where are the miracles today? For example, when was the last time someone drank poison that did not hurt them as Paul did, Acts 28 verses 3 to 5, and the 12 apostles did, Mark 16 verses 17 to 20, or supernaturally moved a couch from one part of a house to another? Where are the gifts of healings today? Sure, some Pentecostals claim healings today, but those healings always have some leeway in there to where you cannot say with 100% certainty that God healed someone. Where is, for example, the physical evidence of a legitimately blind person receiving sight or someone without any legs receiving legs instantly? Next is the gift of helps. 
Phoebe is mentioned in Romans 16 verses 1 to 2 as someone who helped. Therefore, she probably had this gift. I know of no one today who has ever claimed to be given the supernatural gift of helps by God. Granted, there are people whose personality and training may lead them to be nurses, or they naturally look to help people out. But remember, these are supernaturally given gifts to believers, with the Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, I. Corinthians 12 11. This means that, if you have the gift of helps, you may not have been good at helping people before you were saved, or else how is it a gift? Then, you believed the gospel, spoke in tongues, and eventually moved up to having this gift of helps given to you by the Spirit because of sound doctrine built up in your inner man to the point where the Spirit determined that you were now spiritually mature enough to help others. This concept is hard to explain and understand simply because God does not give spiritual gifts today and no one tries to fake this gift. The same holds true for the next spiritual gift of governments. How does one get the spiritual gift of government? What does it look like? I have no idea. I never saw such a gift manifested or even talked about in the Pentecostal church I grew up in. My point is that, if spiritual gifts are in operation today, we would find at least some churches out there that have all the gifts in operation at the same time. Even if we did not have the gift of helps or government, we would at least know what they are. The fact that we do not shows that the gifts are not in operation today. In other words, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 lists eight spiritual gifts in order, and no church has all eight in operation today. Therefore, the spiritual gifts have ceased functioning. Pentecostals use 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 almost exclusively to support the gift of tongues, which is listed dead last year. How can you have the gift of tongues without the gifts of helps and governments, since those gifts are listed as being more important than diversities of tongues? In other words, if any of the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 are not in operation today, it would be the least valuable ones, which means that diversities of tongues would be the first gift that God got rid of. So, how is the gift of tongues still around when gifts of helps and governments, which God says are more important, are not operating today? Yes, I know there are people who help and there are people who govern, but they do not do so supernaturally. They do so by having the personality and training for those things, which occurs irrespective of their life in Christ. In other words, no nurse or government administrator suddenly becomes super great at helps or governing just because he is saved, and the Holy Ghost gives him that gift. If that were the case, our highest government officials would all be stellar Christians, which is laughable to even think about. Logic demands, then, that the gift of tongues is also not in operation today. I have worked in government for over 20 years, and I can tell you that I did not receive a spiritual gift to do so. I had to learn how government works, like everyone else I work with had to do. Charity 1 Corinthians 13 In the first three verses of chapter 13, Paul says that he could speak with men's tongues and angels' tongues, prophesy, understand all mysteries, have all knowledge, have all faith, give everything he has to the poor, and give his body to be burned, and he would be nothing without charity. This means that charity is far more important than spiritual gifts, yet Pentecostals continue to focus on speaking in tongues as a sign of spiritual maturity. Colossians 3 verses 5 to 9 says to put to death all sin and works of the flesh. Colossians 3 verses 12 to 14 says to put on mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbear one another, and forgive one another. Then, it says above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. In other words, if you want to be perfect or complete, you must have charity in whatever you do. Ephesians 3 verse 19 says that the love of Christ passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. The reason is because God is love, 1 John 4 verse 8. What all of these verses demonstrate is that charity, or God's love, is the power of God to save people and for them to come unto the knowledge of the truth, which is God's will for everyone, 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 to 4.
Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13 verse 35. Given these verses, my question is, why do charismatics focus so much on speaking in tongues? Even if tongues do exist today, why not focus on having God's love come through your life, because that is what God is focused on. Love is the measure of how well a marriage is going, not if the married couple can speak a language that no one else knows. This is precisely Paul's point in bringing up charity in 1 Corinthians 13, right in the middle of his discussion of spiritual gifts. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass, or a tinkling cymbal. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 so, forget about speaking in tongues. Focus on charity. Paul says to covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet shew I unto you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 31. In other words, do not be happy with tongues, but seek to become more spiritually mature with sound doctrine so that you can move up the spiritual gift hierarchy. However, regardless of where you are on the spiritual gift hierarchy, the more excellent way is to have God's charity come through you to others, because Paul then spends the first three verses of chapter 13 saying that, even if you had all the spiritual gifts, you would be nothing without charity. Therefore, whenever a Pentecostal talks about how important speaking in tongues is, point him to 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 3 and show him from the word of God that charity is even more important. After these three verses, Paul spends the next four verses, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7, giving you charity's qualities. Charity is long-suffering, is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, seeks others' well-being, is not easily angered, thinks no evil, rejoices only in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. In summary, charity never faileth, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8. This shows that charity, which is God's love, is the best thing you could possibly possess. Yet, whenever someone tells a Pentecostal that tongues are not for today, the Pentecostal goes running to 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 to tell you how great tongues are and that everyone should seek to speak in tongues. However, if the Pentecostal read and believed these three chapters, he certainly would come away thinking that the thing to be desired above all things is charity, not tongues. In fact, it is impossible for a Bible believer to take an objective look at these three chapters and say, boy, I sure wish I spoke in tongues. Instead, the objective Bible believer would always conclude, I want to know the love of Christ. This was Paul's goal. He said, that I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3 verse 10. In other words, Paul was saying, I want to suffer like Christ, because, if I do, then I will know Christ, because I will trust in Christ, rather than in my own flesh. I will then know God's love intimately. There are very few things that are so valuable that you are willing to suffer for them. God's love is the most valuable of these things, and yet the charismatic has the audacity to say that tongues are more important than God's love. Yes, I know charismatics would not actually say those exact words, but that is the message they convey when they tell you to read 1 Corinthians 12-14 so that you will desire to speak in tongues like they do. What I learn, when I read those chapters, is that you should desire to know the love of Christ. Then, when you get to 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8, Paul says that prophecies shall fail, tongues shall cease, and knowledge shall vanish away. Now, God's prophecies do not fail in the sense that they fail to come to pass. Therefore, this verse is saying that there will come a time when the spiritual gifts will no longer be in operation the perfect, causes tongues to cease. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 9 to 13 tells you when this time will come. Verse 9 says that we know in part, and we prophesy in part. In other words, sound doctrine was coming to the Corinthians, in part, through the spiritual gifts of knowledge and prophecy.
The other part or other way that sound doctrine was coming to them was through God's written word. Verse 10 says, When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We already know, from verse 9, that that which is in part is spiritual gifts. So, once that which is perfect is come, then spiritual gifts will cease. What is the perfect in verse 10? Verse 11 says that when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. This tells us that, whatever the perfect is, it will cause you, spiritually speaking, to go from being a child to being an adult. Speaking in tongues would be speaking as a child, since Paul says that, when you speak in an unknown tongue, no man understands you, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2. Verse 12 says, Now we see through glass, darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. This tells us, again, that when the perfect comes, we will have full knowledge, rather than partial knowledge. Ephesians 1 verses 8 to 9 says that God hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Colossians 1 verse 25 says that the mystery was given to Paul to fulfill the word of God. This tells us that the perfect of 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10 must be God's completed word. Therefore, when God completed his word with the information given to Paul, the spiritual gifts passed off the scene. This is why no one today has ever seen the gifts of helps or governments because they do not exist and no one desires to fake them. This conclusion is confirmed by Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 16. Verse 11 lists spiritual gifts given to the body of Christ. These gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Again, these are supernatural gifts. Pastors and teachers exist today not because God supernaturally gave them, but because people study to the point where they were qualified for those positions. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul does not say that a bishop is one who has the supernatural gift to be a bishop. Rather, he gives qualifications that show charity working through the person's life over a period of time that make him sufficient to be the overseer of the church, 1 Timothy 3 verses 2-7. If the spiritual gifts were still in operation at the time that 1 Timothy was written, there would be no need for such a list. Now, Ephesians 4 verses 13 to 14 says that the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were given to the church till we all come. In other words, we are again told that the spiritual gifts were temporary. Again, we are told that the gifts pass off the scene when we come in, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, that we henceforth be no more children. So, perfect and children are mentioned, as in 1 Corinthians 13. The way we are no longer children is when we are no longer tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4 verse 14, because we have the sound doctrine built up in the inner man that enables us to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4 verse 15. There is God's love being mentioned, as in 1 Corinthians 13. Remember that Paul said that he would show the Corinthians a more excellent way, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 31. The more excellent way is to replace the spiritual gifts that only allow you to know in part with perfect knowledge that allows you to speak truth, not because God is supernaturally giving you the words to say, but because the truth is in the inner man so that you now speak the truth in love. Doing so allows the body of Christ to increase through the edifying of itself in love, Ephesians 4 verse 16. This shows how much greater it is to read and believe God's perfect, written word, than it is to get it piecemeal through a supernatural gift, because those speaking in tongues are just speaking spiritual truths that they do not understand. Only those with sound doctrine built up in the inner man through God's written word are able to speak the truth in love, which increases the chance that people will be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. This is why God's love is the more excellent way. Seeing face to face. Pentecostals will say that seeing face to face refers to going to heaven, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. Therefore, tongues continue until the rapture.
However, this is walking by sight, not by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Also, their interpretation is not consistent with the wording and the contextual explanation we have already understood in both 1 Corinthians 13 and in Ephesians 4. Face to face is explained to us in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 7 to 18 says that the Mosaic law was so glorious that Moses had to put a veil over his face in order for unbelieving Israel to look at him. This is true in spite of the fact that the Mosaic law is called the ministration of death, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 8. In other words, the sound doctrine found in Paul's epistles is much more glorious than what was found in the Mosaic law. The reason is because the Mosaic law worketh wrath, Romans 4 verse 15. The Mosaic law shows the law of sin and death, while Paul's epistles show the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 2. Not only are Paul's epistles more glorious, but also the veil is done away in Christ, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 14. Therefore, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. This means that we use our face to behold the face of the Lord in the words of the sound doctrine in Paul's epistles. We have an open face because the Holy Ghost is given unto us to teach us the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 11 to 14. By contrast, Israel under Moses was in unbelief. This is why they needed a veil. Bible believers in the body of Christ today have the Holy Ghost and so, spiritually speaking, we have an open face to see God's word. We also have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, and Jesus Christ is the word, John 1 verse 1. This is why 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, when we read God's word, our spiritual face sees the spiritual face of Jesus Christ. This means that we can actually read and understand the spiritual things of God. Now, going back to 1 Corinthians 13 verse 9, we are told that the Corinthians knew in part and prophesied in part, meaning that they received spiritual knowledge, in part, through the gifts of the Spirit. This is equated to seeing through a glass darkly, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. However, when the perfect is come, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10, they would then see face to face, which is equated to knowing even as also I am known, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. This face to face viewing, then, is not a physical viewing of Jesus' face, because the context is not heaven or the rapture. The context is doctrine. Thus, the face to face viewing is a spiritual viewing. Remember, we walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, dot. Our spirits are made alive in Christ so that we have an open face to learn the deep things of God, and we have the Holy Ghost given unto us so that we see Christ's face, the Word, John 1 verse 1, when we come to Scripture. Thus, seeing face to face occurs once the Word of God is completed. Before then, they only knew in part, I. Corinthians 13 12, because they could not behold the face of Christ, due to the veil of speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy, which kept the person from seeing the things of God clearly, if the flesh got in the way, which we find out in chapter 14 happened quite frequently with the Corinthians. Thus, the result was partial knowledge. However, when a Bible believer comes face to face with God's completed word, i.e., the believer's spirit views the spirit of Jesus Christ in the word of God, then shall I know even as also I am known, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. When that took place, the spiritual gifts passed off the scene, and there abides three things, 1. Faith, 2. Hope, and 3. Charity, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13. Full faith replaces the partial faith that comes from not having the completed word. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God.
Romans 12 verse 3 says that spiritual gifts were given according to every man's measure of faith. Romans 12 verse 6 says that the prophet is to prophesy according to the proportion of faith. In other words, the more faith you have, the more spiritual maturity you have to handle more important slash edifying spiritual gifts. Every man gets a spiritual gift according to the amount of faith he has so that he can be built up in the faith with a greater spiritual gift. However, when full faith is come, the spiritual gifts are not needed because the completed word of God does the work that the spiritual gifts used to do. This is why Ephesians 4 verse 13 says that the spiritual gifts are given till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The unity of the faith equals God's completed word, since faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This results in us having the knowledge of the Son of God, through God's completed word. This results in a perfect man, which goes back to I Corinthians 13 10's mention of the perfect coming. Technically, then, the perfect, of 1 Corinthians 13 verse 10, is a reference to the perfect body of Christ, which has been made perfect through God's completed word. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 to 17 says that the scripture makes the man of God perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. How does tongues accomplish this? It does not. Rather, it is a childish gift that is put away when the completed word of God is come, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11, where once tongues, interpretations, prophecies, and other spiritual gifts were, faith now abides in its place. Therefore, when someone seeks after tongues today, rather than God's word, he has become more spiritually immature. Hope is the second thing mentioned that abides, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13, because we have hope or the confident expectation of eternal life in Christ in heavenly places. The third thing mentioned is charity. It is called the greatest of the three because charity or God's love comes through us for all eternity as a result of living by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 2, as we allow Christ to live out sound doctrine through us in heavenly places. Thus, charity is the application of faith. Where do tongues rank in here? They are not even mentioned because they pass away because they are only a small part of the faith process that can easily be hindered by other tongue talkers talking at the same time, by not having anyone with the gift of interpretation around, or by not having a prophet to say if what was spoken was of the Lord or not. All of these fleshly interferences are done away with the completed word of God, provided a saved individual reads and believes God's word, allowing the Holy Ghost to teach it to him directly. The reason tongues are exalted by Pentecostals is precisely because they can be abused in the flesh very easily. If I have great knowledge of God's word and apply it so that God's love comes through me, it will take a while for you to see Christ living in me, and you will have to be looking for it. Also, it takes a whole lot of time before God's word is built up in me. However, if Pentecostals say that the Holy Ghost speaks by tongue talking and they immediately start tongue talking, they will appear to be spiritual giants immediately without any studying necessary. Therefore, if your goal is to exhibit God's love, you will seek to know Christ through studying and believing God's word, applying sound doctrine to the point of suffering, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. However, if you love the praise of men more than the praise of God, John 12 verse 43, and desire to make a fair shoot in the flesh, Galatians 6 verse 12, you will seek the fun, emotional experience of tongue talking over everything else. This is what Paul warns against in 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Paul starts the chapter with follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. This one verse builds upon the previous two chapters, setting the tone for chapter 14. Since charity is the more excellent way, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 31, you should seek charity. The way you have charity is by building sound doctrine up in the inner man and then applying it in your daily life, 
leading to suffering for godly living, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, which ultimately results in the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us, Romans 5 verses 3 to 5. This should be the primary goal of all Christians, as Paul said, that I may know, Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, Philippians 3 verse 10. Therefore, Paul starts chapter 14 by telling the Corinthians that they should only desire spiritual gifts as a follow-up to the love of God working in their lives by sound doctrine. He then says that, if you are growing, then the spiritual gift you should be desiring is prophecy, not tongues. Why? Because the tongue talker speaks to God, not to men, while the prophet speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 2 to 3. Right away, Paul says that tongue talking does the church no good, while prophesying edifies, exhorts, and comforts. Therefore, if spiritual gifts were still in operation today as Pentecostals claim they are, they should seek to prophesy, not to speak in tongues. Now, we have already shown that tongue talking by the Spirit of God has already passed away, which means that tongue talkers today do not even speak to God. Kundalini Yoga is a part of the Hindu religion, part of which involves convulsing and speaking in tongues. If you saw a Pentecostal moving and speaking in the spirit and compared it to someone in Kundalini Yoga, they would look very similar. This shows how dangerous tongue talking is. A Christian would never go to a seance where a medium is consulted because it is of the devil. Why, then, would he go to a Pentecostal church where people speak in other tongues by the devil? However, since most Pentecostals cannot be convinced that tongue talking today is of the devil, let us examine 1 Corinthians 14 with the assumption that tongue talking is of God today, as it was for the Corinthians, and see what it says. In other words, does 1 Corinthians 14 teach the Corinthians that they should desire to speak in tongues? 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2 is used by most Pentecostals to say that speaking in tongues is your own private prayer language to God. Granted, that is what the verse says, but it says it as a reason why you should desire to prophesy rather than speak in tongues. The point is that, when you speak in tongues, God understands what you are saying. It does no good to give sound doctrine to God because He already knows it all. By contrast, Prophesying edifies, exhorts, and comforts the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. The tongue talker does edify himself, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, but no one else benefits. Therefore, rather than being a proof that you should speak in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2 is a proof against it. In other words, when you speak in tongues, only you and God know what you are talking about. Therefore, you are wasting everyone else's time because they cannot be edified by it. On the other hand, prophecy edifies everyone. So, why would anyone prefer speaking in tongues over prophecy? The reason is because tongue talking makes you feel good emotionally. My grandmother was a member of the Church of God of Prophecy for the last 90 years of her life, and she spoke in tongues throughout those 90 years. It was a legalistic church, which made her always worry about losing her salvation. Even on her deathbed, she said, I just hope I can make it into heaven. When she was 89 years old, I took her from California to North Carolina to visit the church she originally joined at age 16. We went over to a longtime church member's house, but she was not there. She had admitted herself into a nursing home. The note she left on her house was that no one should enter, due to general sickness. She had literally stressed herself out over trying to obey the rules of the church to the point that she had made herself physically sick. Growing up in that environment, I also got sick once per week, feeling like I would never measure up to God's perfect standard. However, my grandmother stayed relatively well physically. I believe it was due to speaking in tongues, something I never did. Whenever she spoke in tongues, she had a happiness like no other. So, I do understand that speaking in tongues has its benefits, but it is only emotional benefits, just like you get from watching your favorite sports team win a game.
The happiest men I ever saw were those running to a particular spot on Auburn University's campus to toilet paper the trees there after an Auburn win. To those men, it was a great joy for their team to beat Alabama. However, spiritually speaking, the win was useless. Similarly, someone speaking in tongues may have wonderful happiness, but if that is all they have, they are spiritually bankrupt. In fact, speaking in tongues is a lot worse than cheering on your favorite sports team. If I asked those Auburn men why they should go to heaven, they would not say it is because of their great love for Auburn. However, if I ask a Pentecostal why she should go to heaven, she will probably say because she has the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. Therein lies the danger. Pentecostals, the emotional experience of speaking in tongues to their eternal resting place when salvation is based solely upon believing the gospel. It does not matter how you feel. All that matters is that you have recognized your sin and have trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Maybe the Auburn man would go to church the day after his toilet paper celebration, hear the gospel, and receive eternal life, but the Pentecostal woman will not go to a different church that teaches believing the gospel in order to be saved, because that would be quenching the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, or denying the power of God. This is because the Auburn man has not attached his football team to his eternal dwelling place, while the Pentecostal woman has attached her speaking in tongues to her ability to go to heaven. However, Romans 1 verse 16 says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The Bible never says that speaking in tongues is the power of God unto salvation. Therefore, by accepting emotionalism by speaking in tongues, the Pentecostal rejects the true power of God for eternal life, which is believing the gospel, because only faith pleases God, Hebrews 11 verse 6, not a good, emotional experience. How do you quench the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19? Since I brought it up, how do you quench the Spirit? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16 says, Rejoice evermore. Why do you rejoice evermore? Because in the Lord, you can rejoice always, Philippians 4 verse 4, meaning you can rejoice all the way to heaven because of what you have in Christ. You know that you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3, and that you are seated together with Christ Jesus in heavenly places, Ephesians 2 verse 6. You know this, not because you felt good by speaking in tongues, but because God told you in his word. Therefore, the joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 8 verse 10. The way you use God's word in your inner man is that you pray the word of God in your mind, meaning that you talk over the sound doctrine of God's word in your mind, Ephesians 6 verses 17 to 18. This is what the next verse in 1 Thessalonians means when it commands to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. When you do that, you know that God always causeth us to triumph in Christ, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14, because all things work together for good to them that love God, Romans 8 verse 28. Therefore, you follow the next verse by giving thanks in everything, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. The more sound doctrine you know, the more you can see God working through you. The way you know that sound doctrine is by reading God's word and allowing the Spirit of God to teach it to you, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. I hath not seen the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 10. Therefore, we are not to quench the Spirit's work in our lives to teach us the things of God so that we allow Christ to live in us, rather than living according to the lusts of our flesh, Galatians 2 verse 20. Therefore, quench not. The Spirit means to read and believe God's word, rather than getting caught up in emotionalism. This means that, when Pentecostals speak in tongues, they are actually guilty of disobeying one of their favorite verses. This meaning of quench not the spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19, is further substantiated by the two verses following it.
The spies not prophesying's 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20 means that the Thessalonians should listen to what the Lord is speaking through the prophets that were still in the church. They should then prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, which means that they should test all doctrine by the scripture and only believe what lines up with scripture. If they do this, they quench not the spirit. Therefore, quenching the spirit has nothing to do with tongue talking or moving in the spirit. Neither one of those things is even mentioned in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4 proves today's tongue talking is not of God. Getting back to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4 says that the person speaking in tongues edifies himself. Remember our study of Acts 2. There, the 120 in the upper room were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, Acts 2 verse 4. Meanwhile, those in the audience heard every man in their own tongue, Acts 2 verse 8, the wonderful works of God, Acts 2 verse 11. As we have already mentioned, tongues were used differently for a different purpose in Acts 2 than they were with the Corinthians. However, we can learn from Acts 2 that, when a person spoke in other tongues, he really did not speak in other tongues. Rather, people heard what he said in other tongues. In other words, the gift of tongues was with the listener to be able to comprehend what was being said, not with the speaker. With the Corinthians, tongues were spoken that no one could understand because an interpreter was required. However, the principle of Acts 2 helps us understand Paul's statement that he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4. Applied to the Corinthians, the tongue talker was really talking in his native tongue, but the people in the church heard it as gobble dash. D. Goop. Therefore, what is going on in the tongue gift is that the speaker is speaking the mysteries of God that the Spirit gives him to speak and only the tongue talker and God understand it, unless there is an interpreter. This is how the tongue talker edifies himself, but no one else. In order for us to understand true tongue talking, we must get our learning entirely from Scripture, because tongue talking by the Spirit of God does not go on today. Therefore, we cannot rely upon Pentecostals to tell us of its benefits, since those benefits can only be fleshly in nature since tongue talking today is of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4 is also another proof that today's tongue talking is not of God. My grandmother spoke in tongues for 90 years. Not once did she tell me in English what the words were that she spoke. That is because she did not learn anything from the tongue talking. It was only a good, emotional experience for her. Yet, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4 says that the tongue talker edifieth himself. Edification occurs when you grow spiritually. There is no spiritual growth in tongue talking today because even the tongue talker does not learn sound doctrine from it. In fact, as we have learned, the opposite happens. Therefore, there is no edification of the tongue talker today. Since there is no edification and 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4 says that the tongue talker does edify himself, we must conclude that tongue talking today is not of God. Another factor to keep in mind is the principle of God's completed revelation that the scripture teaches us. Colossians 1 verse 25 says that the information given to Paul was given to him by God to fulfill the word of God. In other words, once Paul penned his last book, the word of God was complete, Hebrews revelation, then, must have been completed before Paul wrote his last epistle, as was the rest of the Bible. Also, Revelation 22 verse 18 says, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. Since God says that his word is complete, God must not be speaking through tongue talkers today, or else God is a liar, which he cannot do, Titus 1 verse 2. Therefore, God cannot be sharing any new information through interpreted tongues today. This means that, today, there is no sound, spiritual purpose for speaking in tongues and then having it interpreted. So, 
Why not just study God's word to find out what God says, rather than waiting for an interpretation which may or may not come? God says that we must study and be workmen in order to be approved by God, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. God also says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, Hebrews 11 verse 6, not those who sit around waiting for an interpretation. God also says that he has concealed matters so that only believers will understand them, Proverbs 25 verse 2. This means that God is pleased with us and rewards us when we study his word. God is not pleased with us when we abandon his word and speak in tongues instead. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5 prophets better than tongue talkers. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5 says that the prophet is greater than the tongue talker because the tongue talker only edifies the church if someone else interprets. Therefore, the Corinthians should desire to be prophets rather than being tongue talkers. However, with God's completed word today, all of the spiritual gifts have ceased to exist because we all have the Holy Ghost given unto us to teach us the things of God. Therefore, we can rely solely upon God's objective method of teaching us the things of God through His written word, rather than hearing a tongue, waiting for an interpretation, and then listening to a prophet to tell us that what was said is of God or not. Reading God's word and having God tell you what His word says is also a much easier and clearer method to learn the things of God than tongue talking. For example, let us say that you only understood Japanese. If you wanted to know what I said about tongue talking, which of the following would you do? 1. Read a Japanese translation of this book, there is none. This is just for illustrative purposes. Or 2. Find someone who has read my English book who also knows Japanese and ask that person to tell you what the book says. Clearly the first option is the more accurate option, because the author of the book wrote the book in your language. You did not have to rely upon a middleman, who may have misunderstood the book, to tell you what the author said. Similarly, if you want to know what God says, pick up his book and let him teach it to you by the Holy Ghost, rather than finding someone who says they talk for God and having them tell you what God says. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 6 to 11, following a good feeling is not of God. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 6, Paul continues that there is no prophet to the church in speaking in tongues. In verses 7 to 11, Paul likens speaking in tongues to playing random notes on an instrument. Random notes are just noise. They tell you nothing and are not pleasing to the ear. Similarly, speaking in tongues provides no benefit to the church. The key is that, as Christians, we are to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. We should look at the spiritual rather than the physical. The church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, not the place you go to for a good, emotional experience. If you are looking for good emotions, follow a sports team or find a hobby that makes you happy. Do not bring God into your emotional experience. James says that God wants someone to come to the church, come into the knowledge of the truth, and live a life of works that has meekness of wisdom, James 3 verse 13. Those who base their decisions upon emotions are using the devil's wisdom. In fact, James calls the devil's wisdom earthly and sensual, i.e., it is based on the senses, James 3 verse 15. By contrast, God's wisdom is first pure, meaning that it is not corrupted by emotions, James 3 verse 17. Good emotions should come out of sound doctrine being practiced, rather than coming to church solely for emotions. In other words, God designed emotions to proceed out of good doctrine, as Jesus did when he overturned the tables of the money changers, John 2 verses 13 to 17. He did not design sound doctrine to come out of emotions. That will not happen, because that is how the devil does things, according to James 3 verse 15. Sadly, because people follow the lusts of the flesh, they come to church to feel good. Which, for a Pentecostal, means speaking in tongues. Paul says that the church is not benefited if you play random notes on an instrument. Similarly, the church does not receive benefit if people just speak in tongues. For example, I once attended a church that was a typical, 
fundamental church. They had a Korean congregation that met at the same time as the English congregation did. One Sunday morning, the Koreans played instruments and sang a song in Korean for the people in the English congregation to enjoy. Afterward, most of the people were talking about how wonderful that song was. They said it was so beautiful and was the highlight of the service. I told them that I thought it was horrible. People were shocked to hear me say that and wanted to know why I thought that. I said it was horrible because I could not understand a word of it. They said that's because it was in Korean. I said yes, I do not understand Korean. If I understood Korean, I probably would have thought it was great. However, since I do not understand Korean, it was of no use to me. In other words, I was approaching the service from a spiritual standpoint, while they were approaching it from a fleshly standpoint. They thought it was wonderful because the sounds were pleasing to the ear. I thought it was terrible because I was not spiritually edified. The same holds true for weddings. A traditional Catholic wedding includes the singing of Ave Maria. Many people will consider the singing of that song the highlight of the wedding. From a fleshly perspective, it is wonderful because someone sang some beautiful sounding notes. However, from a practical perspective, it is awful because no one there understands the words of the song. It would also be awful if you did understand the words because they worship Mary. The same holds true for opera lovers. Those who enjoy songs that they cannot understand are there for an emotional response rather than for edification. God says that wisdom that is based upon the senses is devilish. James 3 verse 15. God says that God's wisdom is pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. James 3 verse 17. In other words, God's wisdom is full of substance, while the devil's wisdom is full of fluff. This is why Paul tells the Corinthians not to seek after speaking in tongues, because if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 11. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12. Tongues is the white belt of spiritual gifts. Therefore, he tells the Corinthians that, since they are zealous of spiritual gifts, they should seek to possess the gifts that excel to the edifying of the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12, and tongues is the only spiritual gift that does not edify the church. Therefore, it should not be sought. Seeking to speak in tongues is like seeking a white belt in karate. Anyone can get a white belt. It is what you start off with. No one seeks the beginner's belt. Similarly, no one should seek the beginner's gift of speaking in tongues. They should seek a better spiritual gift. However, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17, and tongues is the easiest gift to use for an exaltation of the flesh. Therefore, all the Corinthians wanted to do was speak in tongues. You may say, wouldn't the gift of healings exalt the flesh more? Yes, it could. However, the Spirit divides to every man's spiritual gifts severally as he will, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11. In other words, the Spirit only gives to people the spiritual gifts that they can handle, according to their measure of faith, Romans 12 verse 3. In God's list of 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28, gifts of healings are the fifth most important gift, while the gift of tongues ranks dead last. Therefore, the white belt of spiritual gifts is tongues. If you do not increase in faith and sound doctrine, the Spirit will not deem you worthy to have a higher spiritual gift, which means you will not get the gift of healing. There is much more potential pride in healing someone than there is in blabbing a bunch of nonsense syllables. Since the Corinthians were carnal, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3, they did not show themselves to be worthy of using the higher gift of healing. Therefore, if their goal were to exalt their own flesh, they could not receive the gift of healings. As long as they were carnal, they were stuck with the speaking in tongues gift, and so they used that gift in a carnal way. Look at the disciples. 
Jesus Christ gave them the power to cast out devils, and they told Jesus, Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name, Luke 10 verse 17. They handled the gift responsibly. Therefore, Jesus gave them power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, Luke 10 verse 19. Jesus warned them, notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven, Luke 10 verse 20. In other words, the only thing that a believer should boast in is the cross of Christ. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6 verse 14. The believer should not boast in any spiritual gift. Rather, the believer's attitude should be, we are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do, Luke 17 verse 10. By the way, Jesus gave this power to 70 people who were in addition to the original 12 apostles, Luke 10 verse 1, 9 colon 1. Luke 10 is the only time that a group of 70 disciples with a spiritual gift are mentioned. Before and after that, the 12 apostles are mentioned. What happened to the 70? Perhaps they got prideful when miracles were done through them and Jesus had to take that power away from them. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 verse 16. If your focus is anything but the cross of Christ, your focus is on the wrong place. Since the Corinthians were carnal, they were focused on the flesh, which is why they all wanted to speak in tongues rather than prophesying or having a higher gift. Therefore, Pentecostals, rather than showing their spirituality when they speak in tongues and move in the spirit, are actually showing their carnality and fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 13 to 20, 2 seconds verses. 1 hour. If they sought spiritual gifts to the edifying of the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12, those speaking in tongues would pray that they may interpret 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13. Speaking in tongues by itself only edifies the person speaking, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, since no one else understands him. Therefore, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 14. It is better, then, to pray the word of God, as we are commanded to do in Ephesians 6 verses 17 to 18, in a known tongue, so that I pray both with the Spirit and with the understanding, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15, than to pray in an unknown tongue. Paul says, In the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 19. Pentecostals are out there. Today, teaching others how to speak in tongues, thinking that it is some grand thing. Yet, Paul says that speaking in tongues is so insignificant that it is better to speak five words, such as Christ died for our sins, Romans 5 verse 8, yet not I, but Christ, Galatians 2 verse 20, or I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2 verse 20, than it is to spend a whole hour speaking in another tongue. The average person speaks at a rate of 9,000 words per hour. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 19 says that, If I have sound doctrine built up in my inner man, I can bring more profit to someone in two seconds than a Pentecostal church can in a whole hour. Therefore, instead of teaching other people how to speak in tongues, Pentecostals should be teaching others the gospel and how life in Christ works. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 21 to 22 tongues equals unbelief, prophecy equals belief. Now, Paul does say, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 18. In 1 Corinthians 14 verses 21 to 22, he tells you why. First, he quotes Isaiah 28 verses 11 to 12 to show that God had said that he would speak to Israel with other tongues, and Israel still would not hear God. Then, he says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Remember what we said when we covered Isaiah 28. 
Jesus spoke plainly to Israel in Matthew 5 to 7, starting in Matthew 13, Jesus spoke to Israel in parables because they had rejected him as their Messiah. Therefore, he was now separating out a foolish nation, Deuteronomy 32 verse 21, Matthew 21 verse 43, from Israel, meaning that the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, would be the believers who come out of the apostate nation of Israel. By speaking in parables, only those with the ears to hear, Matthew 13 verse 9, would learn the mysteries of the kingdom, while the unbelievers would not, Matthew 13 verse 11. Similarly, God starts speaking to Israel through tongues in Acts 2 so that only the lost sheep of the house of Israel would hear the gospel and believe, while unbelievers would not understand the speaking in tongues. This is important because the speaking in tongues will be done in the great tribulation period in front of a bunch of unbelievers, as believing Israel will be brought before rulers and kings, Mark 13 verses 9 to 11. If believing Israel were to speak the gospel in a plain language that rulers and kings could understand, they would be silenced. Only by speaking in tongues will the unbelieving rulers allow the gospel to be spoken to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The lost sheep will then hear the wonderful works of God spoken in their own tongues, Acts 2 verse 11. Therefore, when Paul says that tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22, he is saying that the reason God has believers speak in other tongues is not to show how spiritual those people are or to show God's power coming through them. Rather, it shows the unbelief of some of the hearers. Tongues are a sign of unbelief. By contrast, prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22. Prophesying is speaking the words of the Lord in a language that everyone can understand. It is much easier to understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew 5 to 7 than it is to understand his parables in Matthew 13 and following. Similarly, it is much easier to understand the plain word of God in your own language than to have someone speak those same words to you in another language that you do not understand. Therefore, desiring the gift of tongues is desiring confusion while desiring. The gift of prophecy is desiring clarity. This is why Paul tells the Corinthians to covet to prophesy over speaking in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 39. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, Paul said, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. In Romans 11 verse 11, Paul says that salvation has come to the Gentiles through Israel's fall in order to provoke Israel to jealousy. Therefore, the reason that Paul thanks God that he speaks with tongues more than the Corinthians do, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 18, is because tongues were assigned to the Jews of their unbelief. Paul's desire is for Israel to be saved, Romans 10 verse 1. Since tongues could provoke Israel to jealousy, Paul was glad that he spoke with other tongues. In other words, as long as Paul spoke in tongues, it meant that the lost sheep of the house of Israel could be provoked to jealousy in order to see that God had taken away their favored nation status, which may result in them being saved. At the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, Jesus stood up and set aside Israel's program, Acts 7 verses 55 to 56. Paul said, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, Romans 10 verse 1. Paul said that he was willing to be bound and die in Jerusalem if it meant he got to share the gospel with more Jews, Acts 21 verse 13. Paul said, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, Romans 9 verses 3 to 4. These verses show Paul's great love for Israel to be saved. When the Lord Jesus Christ set aside Israel's program, Israel still had a chance to believe and be saved in the dispensation of grace that was committed to Paul, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17. This is seen in Stephen's statement by the Holy Ghost, Lord, Lay not this sin to their charge, Acts 7 verse 60, and by Jesus Christ's statement to Paul that he was to bear Jesus' name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, Acts 9 verse 15. Therefore, when Paul preached the gospel in the book of Acts, he first went into the Jewish synagogue, Acts 17 verses 1 to 2.
Then he went to the Gentiles, Acts 13 verses 45 to 46. As long as Paul was speaking in tongues, God was using him to provoke Israel to jealousy. In other words, the reason that Paul says that he thanks God that he speaks in tongues more than the Corinthians is, because it means that Israel still has a chance to be saved under the new dispensation of grace. 1 Corinthians was probably written around Acts 20. The book of Acts ends with the Jews' final rejection of the gospel of grace, and Paul says that they have fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 6 verses 9 to 10 that Israel will not believe, Acts 28 verses 25 to 26. Paul then says, Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it, Acts 28 verse 28. The book of Acts then comes to an end, because salvation is no longer going to the Jews. The word of God is completed shortly thereafter, and speaking in tongues passes off the scene, along with all the other spiritual gifts. The point is that Paul does not thank God that he speaks in tongues more than the Corinthians because they, one, make him appear more spiritual, two, bring him closer to God, or three, increase his understanding. Rather, he thanks God that he speaks in tongues more than the Corinthians do because it gives Jews an opportunity to believe the gospel. For the Gentiles, tongues actually have the opposite effect. Therefore, no one should desire to speak in tongues today. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 23 to 25, tongues today oppose God's will. Paul says that if all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, or unbelievers will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so, falling down on his face he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 23 to 25. Because Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, and God told the Jews that he would speak to them with men of other tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 21, Isaiah 28 verse 11, Paul thanked God that he spoke in tongues so that the Jews might believe. Because the Greeks seek after wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, it was more beneficial for unbelieving Gentiles who come to the Corinthian church to hear clear words from God prophesied to them so that they may believe, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 23 to 25. Once. Jews, as a whole, were written off by God in the dispensation of grace at the end of the book of Acts, God removed the spiritual gift of tongues. Therefore, tongues today are not of God. They have the effect of leading believers into emotionalism away from the truth of God and the effect of leading unbelievers away from God, thinking that believers are crazy. Therefore, speaking in tongues today is in direct opposition to God's twofold will for, one, all men to be saved, and two, to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 26 to 28, no tongue talking without an interpreter. When the spiritual gifts were still in operation, Paul says that all things are to be done unto edifying, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26. He said that if people were to speak in unknown tongues, no more than two or three should do it, and they should do it one at a time. Then, they should have someone interpret the tongues. If no one had the gift of interpretation, the tongue talkers should keep silent in the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 27 to 28. This is rarely observed today. In the church I grew up in, it was very rare that an interpretation would be given, but tongue talking happened all of the time. People would talk over each other, such that no one could understand what was being said, even if they were talking in English. Recently. I heard of an Assembly of God church where the pastor told everyone to speak in your private prayer language. When he did, most of the church started speaking in tongues aloud all at the same time. How can Pentecostals do such things when 1 Corinthians 14 verses 27 to 28 specifically says that no more than one person is to speak in tongues at a time? Interpretations Tongues and interpretations go hand in hand in 1 Corinthians 14. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 mentions diversities of tongues but does not mention interpreting.
This is probably because tongues and interpretations are required together in order for the church to be edified. Therefore, interpretations are lumped together with speaking in tongues. Therefore, we need to cover interpretations in this book as well, even though they are rarely talked about by Pentecostals today. This shows that Pentecostals are really not concerned about the things of God because 1 Corinthians 14 puts the gift of interpretations above tongues. Verse 5 says that speaking in tongues does absolutely no good in the church unless there is also an interpretation that the church may receive edifying. Verse 13 says that a person who speaks in an unknown tongue should pray that he may interpret. Verses 27 and 28 say that, in the church, no one should speak in tongues unless there is an interpreter. The reason for this is that the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. Therefore, the primary reason for going to church is to learn the truth of God, not to feel good. The truth of God is found in God's word, John 17 verse 17. Therefore, the only usefulness in the church for speaking in tongues out loud is for the church to hear and learn sound doctrine from God. The only way this happens is if there is an interpretation of the speaking in tongues so that the church understands what the Lord is saying to them. Therefore, the gift of interpretation is actually more important than the gift of speaking in tongues, and interpretation is necessary in order for tongues to be spoken in the church. In addition, we need to understand that God's word is to be valued above all else, including above God's own name. Psalm 138 verse 2 says about God that thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God's name is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, Revelation 4 verse 8. God's word was in the beginning, John 1 verse 1, and it will be there in the end, Matthew 24 verse 35. God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4 verse 12. This means that there is nothing more valuable than God's word. Therefore, if speaking in tongues is truly of God today and Pentecostals use 1 Corinthians 14 as their authority for speaking in tongues, then logic would have it that there should be interpretations that are written down and recorded for the benefit of the whole body of Christ. With advanced technology, one would expect that many of these interpretations could be found on the internet from all over the world so that all believers could be edified by them. After all, Psalm 19 verse 10 says regarding God's judgments, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Therefore, Pentecostals should be compiling these interpretations for the benefit of the whole body of Christ. With this in mind, I did several Google searches with varying search terms, and I could not find any interpretations listed on the internet. When I did a YouTube search, I only found two videos that claimed to have interpretations in it. The first YouTube video was mostly music with a bunch of gibberish and convulsing in the spirit going on. Then, a woman took the microphone and said that what God was doing there was just the beginning. God wanted the people to feel more of him and more of his presence. This was a general statement about the service. It was not an interpretation, as they claimed it was. Also, I have no idea what it means. Am I supposed to believe that God went to the trouble of having several people speak gibberish and convulse around, all to tell them that God wanted the people to feel more of him and his presence? Were they only feeling 40% of God and God wanted them to get to 60%? How would they know when that happened? And if it did happen, how would God's will of people being saved and coming unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, be accomplished by feeling God? The second YouTube video was of a six-year-old girl. An adult speaker explained that, in a children's service, nine gifts of the Holy Ghost were written on pieces of paper and put in a bowl. Each child picked one of the slips of paper at random. The six-year-old girl picked interpretation of tongues as her gift. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 says that the way the gifts are given is to every man to profit. With all, it is the Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11.
Furthermore, these gifts are given according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Romans 12 verse 3. Romans 12 verse 6 says that someone with the gift of prophecy is to prophesy according to the proportion of faith. In other words, the Bible clearly states that the Holy Ghost gives the spiritual gifts to people according to what they can handle based upon their faith in God's word. The Holy Ghost does not give gifts at random as you draw a piece of paper from a bowl. You cannot say that the Holy Ghost guided the kids to pick the appropriate gifts because I am sure that, no matter how well versed the kids are in God's word, no six-year-old has enough faith in the inner man to handle some gifts, such as miracles, healings, and helps. Nevertheless, this six-year-old girl gives her first interpretation on the video, which is, yes, God, yes. Her second interpretation, after another woman speaks in tongues, is that God wants to bring healing. This interpretation is confirmed by another woman off camera as being correct. We should also note that none of the women in the video had on a head covering, which goes against the command of 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven, and her head is her husband, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. Therefore, the interpretations were not done in the biblically prescribed way. We should also note that children are not even mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11, which probably means that children are not given any spiritual gifts due to their lack of having built up a measure of faith in order to receive them. Remember that the main reason why Mormonism got rid of tongues was because of adults' objections to children speaking in tongues. More importantly, interpretations of tongues are supposed to convey sound doctrine or truth that is not found in God's written word, and neither one of these interpretations did that. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says that all promises of God in us are yeah. Therefore, the interpretation of yes, God, yes, is not needed. Also, the fact that God sent his son to die for our sins tells me that God wants to bring healing. Therefore, that interpretation is also worthless. What this shows is that, even if speaking in tongues today is of God, it is not being used as God has commanded in Scripture. Therefore, it should not be used at all. As Paul said, if there be no interpreter, let the tongue talker keep silence in the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 28. Since I cannot even... Find one example of tongues and interpretations being used in the biblically prescribed way to edify the body of Christ. Tongues today are not of God. A fair shoe in the flesh. What this all boils down to is the fact that, if you speak in tongues, it appears to be something spontaneous that the Holy Ghost is doing through a person. By contrast, if you prophesy, you are just speaking like a normal human being. Therefore, it is not perceived as something magical from the Lord, because prophesy does not look special. This is also why churches insist that you walk an aisle, kneel at the altar, repeat their prayer, and be water baptized. You are saved the moment you recognize your sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin. However, no one can see that. Therefore, Churches make up something that makes them feel good about your sudden conversion. This is why speaking in tongues is so revered by Pentecostals over everything else. The same holds true for those who follow after healings. This is why tongue talking and gifts of healing are the spiritual gifts that are faked today. It is all about a fair shoe in the flesh, Galatians 6 verse 12, rather than the cross work of Christ, Galatians 6 verse 14. By the way, in the video with the six-year-old girl who interpreted, another girl about her age came on stage and gave her a hug. When asked what gift she had, she said speaking in tongues, but her mother corrected her by saying that she really drew the slip of paper that said healing. Why did she lie? Because she wanted to get the attention that her interpreting friend was getting. Her flesh was not mature enough to fake a healing, but maybe she could fake tongue talking. So. Why do people speak in tongues? To appear to others to be more spiritual or godly. The church I grew up in said that there were three divine works of grace in a person's life. 
A person with all three would say, I am saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. If you did not have all three, you would be hounded by others to pursue what you were missing. You would also be seen as less godly. Anyone could say that they were saved and sanctified without any outward manifestation, but no one could be filled with the Holy Ghost without speaking in tongues, which was seen as a spontaneous thing that the Holy Ghost imparted to you. If you spoke in tongues, then, you had everything that was possible in the spiritual realm. No one would ever question your salvation, sanctification, or having the Holy Ghost. Without the speaking in tongues, however, no one really knew that you were even saved. Therefore, speaking in tongues was the one physical thing you could do to become instantly the most spiritually mature person possible. Therefore, it was only natural that attendees would eventually fake the speaking in tongues, or they would say that they did speak in tongues at one time in their lives, just so their salvation would never be questioned. Either way, all members said that they had spoken in tongues, although not all of them did so on a regular basis. Typically, it would be several women who would go on and on with the speaking in tongues in each service. Even some of the higher-up men would not speak in tongues. For example, I never heard our Sunday school superintendent speak in tongues, even though I did see him run around inside the building a few times, supposedly under the power of the Holy Ghost. I guess he was a Holy Ghost jogger, not a Holy Ghost tongue talker. Therefore, speaking in tongues was the church's standard by which everyone's spirituality was measured. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 29, Prophets and Judges Not Needed Today let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 29 Why don't the Pentecostal churches practice this verse? Because anyone can speak what the Lord says and no one needs to judge if what is said is from the Lord or not because we have God's completed word. In other words, no spiritual gifts of prophecy and judging are needed today because we have God's completed word. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Paul wrote at least three or four letters to the Corinthians, but only two of them are in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9 says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. This tells us that Paul wrote at least one letter to the Corinthians before he wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians. He also wrote other letters to other churches that are not in the Bible. Colossians 4 verse 16 mentions the epistle from Laodicea. Why are they not in the Bible? It is not because the Catholic Council of Carthage in 397 AD decided to leave them out. Rather, members of the body of Christ, with the gift of prophecy, already went through Paul's letters and determined which ones were scripture and which ones were not, at the direction of the Holy Ghost working the prophetic gift within them. This means that prophets had an integral part in putting God's holy word together. Do you now see why Paul told the Corinthians to covet to prophesy, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 39? 2 Peter 3 verses 15 to 16 says, Even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Peter compared Paul's epistles with other scriptures, which shows that some of Paul's epistles were already accepted as scripture before the whole Bible was even completed. This is because the prophets had already declared which of Paul's epistles were scripture and which were not. Therefore, when the Bible was completed, the gift of prophecy was no longer needed because there would be no further written revelations from God. Similarly, then, there was also no need for any other spiritual gifts to be manifested. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 to 17 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If the Bible thoroughly furnishes you unto all good works, then there is no need for any spiritual gifts to be manifested once the Bible was completed.
Again, this goes along with Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 16, which states, in part, that the gifts that Christ gave to the church were only till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man so that we are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We can then speak the truth in love, receiving nourishment from our head, even Christ. Ephesians 4 verse 16 says that, when this takes place, the body of Christ receives from the completed word of God the effectual working in the measure of every part. So, if every part of the body of Christ works together perfectly when we have God's completed word, there is no need for any other spiritual gift, which is why they all passed off the scene when God's word was completed. This means that it is actually a mathematical impossibility for tongues to add anything to the perfect body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 32 to 33, Spirit, Soul, and Body. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 32 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What does that mean? Verse 33 explains it by saying, For God is not the author of confusion. This means that the spirits of the prophets are controlled by God. This is wonderful insight to how God communicates with your soul. You are a three-part being, one, spirit, two, soul, and three, body. Before you are saved, your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1. When you believe the gospel, you are quickened together with Christ and raised up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 verses 5 to 6. This means that your spirit is now alive in Christ because you have received the spirit which is of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12. As you read and believe God's word, the Holy Ghost communicates to your spirit the deep things of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 10 and 13. You can then use the mind of Christ to judge all things, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 15 to 16, so that you make decisions based upon sound doctrine rather than upon the lusts of your flesh. In other words, before you were saved, because your spirit was dead in sins, your soul did whatever your body told it to do. Once you are saved, your spirit is made alive in Christ, and God has reckoned your body to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6 verse 11. What this means is that, once you are saved, your soul can make decisions based upon the sound doctrine that the Holy Ghost teaches your spirit. You can then present your body as a living sacrifice to God, Romans 12 verse 1, to be used as a vessel through which the characteristics of God can come shining through, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. With this understanding, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 32 to 33 makes a whole lot more sense. A prophet can yield his body to be used by God as the Holy Ghost communicates prophecy, i.e., the word of God from the prophet's spirit to his soul and through his body. Therefore, when verse 32 says that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, it is saying that God is working through the spirits, souls, and bodies of the prophets to communicate God's word to man, eliminating the confusion of Satan's lie program and bringing peace to the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33, through edification and exhortation and comfort, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3. This sound doctrine can then enter into the souls of the church members through their spirits hearing and understanding the doctrine. The church can then have Christ living in them by using the mind of Christ to apply the doctrine they just learned. Contrast this process with speaking in tongues. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 14 he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2 This means that, when you either pray or speak in tongues, your spirit and God know what is being said, but the sound doctrine of the tongues is never communicated to your soul. Therefore, if you speak in tongues, you do not understand what you say, and no one else understands what you say. Your flesh lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17. This means that your flesh will try to accomplish in your soul what the spirit accomplishes in your soul through sound doctrine.
Your flesh is also deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. This is why Paul said that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not, Romans 7 verse 18. Note that your flesh is not just wicked, but it is desperately wicked. It is also deceitful above all things. It also wants to provide to your soul what the Spirit provides to your soul, Galatians 5 verse 17, and it is absolutely powerless to accomplish anything of God in you, Romans 7 verse 18. This means that, once you are saved, your flesh will seek to accomplish its wickedness in you, to the exclusion of God getting sound doctrine in your inner man through the Holy Ghost communicating it to your spirit. In order to shut off the flow of sound doctrine from God to your spirit to your soul, your flesh will seek to deceive you into thinking that the flesh is accomplishing in your soul the same thing that the Spirit of God wants to accomplish in your soul. Therefore, the perfect scenario for your flesh after you are saved is that it mimics something that is spiritual so that you never let the Spirit of God edify your soul with the Word of God. In doing so, you quench the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19. Tongues is a great tool for your flesh to accomplish this. All your flesh wants to do is sin. Before you are saved, it accomplishes this all the time. Your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1, and so you do whatever your flesh wants you to do. Sure, you have the conscience, and you may seek to do good things in your flesh, but remember, in your flesh dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Romans 7 verse 18. So, you do things in your flesh that are not really good, but they appear to be good, so that your guilty conscience is appeased. Once you are saved, a whole new dynamic enters the picture. Your spirit is now alive in Christ. You now have the choice to allow Christ to live in you, Galatians 2 verse 20, or to fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5 verse 16. These lusts include all the evil that you want to do, and the good that you attempt to do, since you have the knowledge of both good and evil, Genesis 2 verse 17. Therefore, there is a law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, Romans 7 verse 23. Since no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, Ephesians 5 verse 29, it is an uphill battle to allow God to teach you sound doctrine and use the mind of Christ to allow the faith of Christ to implement that sound doctrine in the decisions that you make, Galatians 2 verse 20. You must die daily, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, to the flesh in order to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3 verse 16. Jesus Christ described his doing this as setting his face like a flint, Isaiah 50 verse 7. Flint is a rock that is used to ignite fire. In other words, in order to obey God, Christ had to allow Satan to set his face on fire, spiritually speaking. This is how you die daily to the flesh. This is why Jesus Christ had to sweat great drops of blood, Luke 22 verse 44, before he was willing to set his face like a flint. Now, Jesus Christ did no sin, 1 Peter 2 verse 22, yet it was still a battle for him always to believe God and not follow his flesh, even though he had no sin nature like we do. My point is that this means that it takes constant decisions by us to listen to and make decisions based upon God's word. Most people will never go to that trouble. This is why, even though we have God's completed word, and we have the Holy Ghost to teach it to us, very few believers actually read the Bible. Among those that read the Bible, very few actually allow the Holy Ghost to teach it to them. Among those that learn sound doctrine, very few actually make decisions using the mind of Christ. What ends up happening, then, is that the vast majority of Christians follow their flesh. But remember, the flesh lusts against the spirit, no good thing dwells in your flesh, your flesh is desperately wicked, and your flesh is deceitful. Put together, this means that most Christians follow the flesh in a way that appears to be godly, but it is not.
having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. Dot. Perhaps an example will help illustrate this. Before you are saved, you may have no trouble going to a bar and getting drunk. After you are saved, your spirit tells you, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit, Ephesians 5 verse 18. Now, your flesh still wants to drink, but you know from your conscience, your church, and your Bible that you should not get drunk. Therefore, you resist your flesh and decide not to go to the bar. The next day, you go to church and you are told that you should give 10% of your income to God. Tithing is not for today. God says that you are to give as your purpose in your heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, rather than a mandatory 10%. If you do something that is not of faith in God's word, then it is a sin, Romans 14 verse 23. This means that if you give 10%, not because you want to, but because your church says you have to, you are sinning by doing so. Now, your flesh wanted to get drunk at the bar, but you did not allow it to do so. Since it is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 17 verse 9, your flesh may step in and say, I am going to give 10% to the church. Your spirit knows that this is not of God, but it takes a lot of effort to fight off the flesh. Giving 10% to God appears to be a spiritual thing. Therefore, you will probably let your flesh deceive you into giving 10% and you will sin. Colossians 2 verse 23 calls this will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. You neglect your body by doing something good, giving God money rather than something evil, getting drunk. In so doing, you are worshiping your will to do good in your flesh, supposedly. This results in no honor being given to God, but you satisfy your flesh instead. When someone comes along and tells you that tithing is not required, you will vehemently oppose it because, if you abandon tithing, your flesh will have to come up with some other scheme whereby it can trick you into following the flesh when you think you are following the spirit. Your flesh will say, but God says that I am robbing him if I do not pay tithes, Malachi 3 verse 8. That is your deceitful heart, lusting against the spirit, trying to come up with spiritual good in a fleshly activity. The truth is that the verses about paying tithes do not apply today. God says in the very next verse that, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation, Malachi 3 verse 9. So, the command to bring tithes into the storehouse, Malachi 3 verse 10, is for a nation. Malachi 3 verse 6 says that God is addressing the sons of Jacob. This would be the nation of Israel. So, the command to give tithes is to the nation of Israel in time past, not to us. Today, even if you are a physical Jew. However, nearly all churches will teach that you must tithe, based upon Malachi 3 verses 8 to 10, because your flesh wants to accomplish something for God, and this is something that it can do. Similarly, when it comes to tongues, this appears to be a godly thing. Pentecostals will argue that they are speaking to God, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2. So, how can that be a bad thing? As we have learned, tongues, in the context, are not a bad thing. Paul even says, forbid not to speak in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 39, but he also says that greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 5. Why? Because of what we covered earlier, prophecy goes from your spirit to your soul to your body, to someone else's body to their soul and then to their spirit. Prophesying is simply speaking the word of God so that people can understand it. Speaking with tongues, if they are of God, is also speaking the word of God, but people cannot understand it. As Paul covered in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 10, when the perfect, God's completed word comes, tongues and prophecies will cease. The reason they cease is because we all are beholding God's word with open face, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18.
I do not need a prophet to tell me thus saith the Lord, when I can open God's word and read for myself what is thus saith the Lord. Therefore, the benefit of edification through tongues, interpretations, and prophecies has been done away with by the completed word of God, which can thoroughly furnish you unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3 verse 17. By desiring tongues, you are really saying, God's word is not sufficient for me to live a godly life. The only other benefit of speaking in tongues was a sign for unbelieving Israel, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22. Since Israel diminished away at the end of Acts, Romans 11 verse 12, that benefit has also gone away. Therefore, tongues have ceased. However, since tongues used to be a way for man to speak to God, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, it can be easy to fool your flesh into thinking that speaking in tongues is a spiritual thing to do, even though God is not using them anymore, just like tithing used to be a spiritual thing to do that God does not use today. As mentioned before, Pentecostals, who speak in tongues today, have a good, emotional feeling from it. There are many other things in this world that could be enjoyed having a good, emotional feeling. However, the difference between enjoying a football game and enjoying speaking in tongues is that tongues appear to be godly, while football does not. Therefore, if I feel happy watching a football game on Saturday, my conscience still tells me that I need to go to church on Sunday to please God. However, if my conscience is seared with the hot iron of religion, 1 Timothy 4 verse 2, into thinking that I am speaking to God by speaking in tongues, I will feel happy as my flesh conjures up the speaking in tongues, and I do not have to do anything else for God. In other words, my flesh can turn a previously spiritual thing into a fleshly thing, deceive my soul into thinking it is a spiritual thing today, and then I never actually have to do any spiritual things. In other words, I do not have to die daily to the flesh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, I do not have to reckon my flesh to be dead indeed unto sin, Romans 6 verse 11, and I can fulfill the lusts of the flesh all I want. Then, if someone calls me out on it, I can point to a scripture or two to prove that I am walking in the Spirit when I am really fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. In other words, tongue talking, and all tenets of religion for that matter, is a vehicle used by your flesh to deceive you into thinking that you are walking in the Spirit, thereby easing your guilty conscience. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Titus 1 verse 16 They are utterly useless when it comes to being used by God, because their conscience has been seared with a hot iron to the point that they are past feeling like they are not serving God. When someone is thoroughly convinced that he is serving God in something that is of the flesh, there is no way you can convince him otherwise. He is past feeling that he is quenching the spirit, to the extent that he has given himself over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, Ephesians 4 verse 19. Just because something appears to be godly, does not mean that it is. They have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. The next verse after Ephesians 4 verse 19 says, But ye have not so learned Christ, Ephesians 4 verse 20. If you have sound doctrine built up in the inner man, you have. Learn to operate by the sound doctrine. If you have religion built up in the inner man, you have learned to follow your flesh. Since your flesh is never satisfied, you will work all uncleanness with greediness, Ephesians 4 verse 19. Therefore, the Christians, who work all uncleanness with greediness, are those who follow religion, not those who do things that the world objects to. For example, if a Christian were getting drunk every week, you probably could tell him that what he was doing was wrong. You could then share sound doctrine with him, and he may listen. However, if you tell a Christian, who speaks in tongues every week, that he is wrong, he will not see it because he is convinced that he is following God, since he has scripture to support his fleshly activity. This is why it is the one who professes to know God, who is unto every good work reprobate, Titus 1 verse 16, not the Christian who is given over to the world. The Christian, following fleshly works to please God, has the perfect cover for his sinful activity, I am living for the Lord. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus, 
and so he will not want to give it up when you confront him with his sin because it means that he will either have to allow Christ to live in him truly or come up with another cover story, which you could also easily destroy. Therefore, he will call you a heretic, cease fellowship with you, and continue in his sin that is also a form of godliness. Remember what Paul told the Corinthian church about the man in sexual sin. He told them to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5. In other words, a Christian who has sex with his father's wife, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, is living in sin. If people are bragging about it in church, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 2, the church may put a religious spin on it to make it out to be a godly activity. Where do you think temple prostitutes came from? Then, the man will never stop cheating on his wife. However, if the man is kicked out of the church, he is delivered unto Satan. His flesh, then, will have a lot more trouble deceiving himself into thinking that sex with his father's wife is a good, spiritual thing because he no longer has a form of godliness. Therefore, he may listen to the Spirit of God telling them that he is wrong, which results in the destruction of the flesh, I. Corinthians 5 colon 5. Based on 2 Corinthians 2 verses 6 to 8, it appears that he did turn from the sin. Because churchianity does not deliver people over to Satan today, sexual sin is just as prevalent in the church as it is outside the church, if not more so. This is why the next verse says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6. Christians will use that verse as an excuse to follow the law, but that is not how Paul uses it. Paul is basically saying that, whenever the church starts sanctioning sin, it is no longer the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, but it is a place that becomes a whole lump of sin that everyone is doing by not listening to sound doctrine, but by listening to religion. This includes tongue talking, water baptism, tithing, becoming a member of the church, and anything else that is a fleshly activity that has been twisted by people to deceive you into thinking you are walking in the spirit when you are not. The danger of tongue talking. This is why tongue talking is so dangerous. Just think. Paul spent three chapters, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, essentially telling the Corinthians that prophesying is better than speaking in tongues and that living in God's love, i.e. charity, is a better way than both. Paul is not promoting tongues in these three chapters, but he is showing that prophesying and charity are much better. And Paul did that when tongues were actually of God and used by God. Now that tongues have ceased, how much more should tongues be avoided? Baptists may say, what's the big deal? I do not speak in tongues myself, but at least the Pentecostals recognize God and are going to heaven. It is true that they are going to heaven and are much better off than unbelievers if they have recognized their sin and trusted in Jesus' death burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin. However, they have been duped into following their flesh instead of the Spirit, and they are unto every good work reprobate, Titus 1 verse 16, meaning that they will never believe sound doctrine that contradicts their philosophy, because it would mean dying to the flesh. Something that none of us wants to do. My grandmother never would believe in eternal security. She was in her church for 90 years, and, on her deathbed, she still said, I hope I can make it into heaven. She was shown the scripture that says she could not lose her salvation, but she never would believe it. Believing eternal security would mean that her church was wrong. They could then be wrong about speaking in tongues, and the great spirituality that she achieved in 90 years would have been destroyed in a flash. Therefore, there was no way of convincing her to believe any doctrine that would have gone against her church. This makes man the final authority rather than God and his word, and this is what is so dangerous about tongue talking. Granted, she is now in heaven for believing the gospel, but the ability to have God's love come through her for all eternity has been greatly diminished as a result of fulfilling the lusts of the flesh through tongue talking rather than being strengthened with might by God's spirit in her inner man, Ephesians 3 verse 16, through the learning and application of sound doctrine found in Paul's epistles.
The evidence of this is seen when you start asking basic Bible questions to Pentecostal churchgoers versus churchgoers of other denominations. What is the gospel by which you are saved? What is a good church service? How does Christ live in you? While a Baptist may not give you a good answer, at least his answer is probably based on at least some scripture, whereas the Pentecostal's answer is probably based entirely upon emotions. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34 to 36, Women Keeping Silence in Church Women are to keep silence in the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34 to 35, because God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 33. This tells us that, when women are allowed to speak, they bring confusion to the service. Why? Because they are more easily deceived by Satan than men are. 1 Timothy 2 verse 12 says that I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. There are two reasons for this. 1. Adam was first formed, then Eve, 1 Timothy 2 verse 13, and 2. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. 1 Timothy 2 verse 14. It is no accident that Paul mentions women keeping silence in the church in the context of the disorder that had taken place in the Corinthian church. Women are more emotional creatures, and so they gravitate more toward emotional displays of tongue talking than men. In the Pentecostal church I grew up in, the vast majority of tongue talking was done by the women. It was rare to hear men speak in tongues for more than a little bit. I used to sit in the pew and pray that sister so-and-so would not start talking in tongues because, if she did, the service would be extended for another 45 to 60 minutes. There was one lady who seemed to extend the service by herself by at least 30 minutes every time we had a night service. The pastor even got fed up with it to the point that he told her to stop speaking in tongues by herself. Since Paul knows that women gravitate toward more emotional displays of the flesh, he says that the women should not even speak in church so that everything is done decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40. If one woman starts speaking in tongues, then several other women will follow her. Once one woman takes control of the service, all of the women are in charge now. They are then functioning as the head of men, which is against God's design for them, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. If a woman does not understand something, she can always ask her husband afterward, where other women would not try to usurp control with her, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 35. This also explains why Paul said that women are to use head coverings when praying or prophesying, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 5 to 6. Head coverings are a visual representation to the church that the woman is of the man, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8. If a woman prays, speaks in tongues, or uses the gift of prophecy in the church, it appears that she has taken control of the service, even though the Holy Ghost is really speaking through her. By using the head covering, it shows that she recognizes that she is of the man, and it keeps other women from trying to usurp authority over the man. Women tend to get offended by these statements, which is why the church I grew up in never used head coverings. It makes sense that women object to wearing head coverings and being told they cannot speak in church because God told Eve, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee, Genesis 3 verse 16. In other words, women desire to rule over men, but God put men over women. Therefore, when this is pointed out, women's flesh is offended, and they try to take control. Because speaking in tongues today is of the flesh, women control these churches, resulting in the confusion that they have. For example, in the church I grew up in, the church wanted to buy a parsonage for the pastor. The problem was that the church did not have the money to do this, and they probably would have lost the church building if they went into more debt to buy the parsonage. While the church allowed women to speak in tongues as much as they wanted, the church recognized 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34 to 35 to apply to business meetings. Therefore, only men could speak and vote on business matters, even though the women were still in attendance. Furthermore, a business matter could only pass if the vote were unanimous.
could only pass if the vote were unanimous. When it came time to vote on the parsonage, everyone voted for it, except my grandfather. Afterward, several men came up to him and thanked him for voting against it. You may wonder, why did they vote for it when they did not think it was a good idea? The answer is because their wives told them to vote for the parsonage. The women in the church used their emotions to make a decision that would have hurt the church and the men in the church did whatever the women wanted because the women controlled the church. Similarly, if women are allowed to speak in tongues whenever they want to, even if tongues are for today, sound doctrine would not be the focus of the service. A man needs to step up as an overseer to keep women from taking the church over with their emotions, 1 Timothy 3 verse 5. Otherwise, the church would not be the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. This is exactly what has happened in churchianity today. Instead of going to church for sound doctrine, people now go to church to feel good. As a result, churchgoers are not living the in Christ life. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 36 is Paul's rhetorical questions regarding where God's word came from. Since God's word came from God and not from the Corinthians, God is in charge of the distribution of his word. Since God says that it is a shame for women to speak in the church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 35, women should not be allowed to take control of a service. God is in charge of the distribution of God's word, not man. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 37 to 40, the practicality of prophets. Paul has already talked about how prophesying is a better gift than speaking in tongues. Now, he says that prophets can use their spiritual gift to acknowledge that what Paul has just said about tongues is of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37. This shows how practical the gift of prophecy is. Therefore, the tongue talkers in the church should covet to prophesy, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 39. They should also exercise their tongue talking gift so that they can grow in their measure of faith and become prophets later. If all things are done decently and in order, God's will is accomplished through the church with their varying gifts. Summary In Genesis 11, God created nations and languages due to man's apostasy. God brought unification of the languages in Acts 2 when the believing remnant of Israel spoke in other tongues and every man heard the wonderful works of God spoken in his own tongue, Acts 2 verses 8 and 11. God set aside Israel's program in Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen. God then began the dispensation of grace, in which we currently live, in Acts 9 verse 23 by giving Paul the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16 verse 25. God allowed speaking in tongues to continue in the grace dispensation for two reasons. First, he wanted to provoke Israel to jealousy, Romans 11 verse 11. By having Israel see the Gentiles speak in other tongues, they should be jealous that God has given their gift of tongues to Gentiles, Acts 10 verses 44 to 46. Second, God conveyed sound doctrine through tongue talking. God gave mystery doctrine to Paul to fulfill the word of God, Colossians 1 verse 25. Until God's word was complete, God gave spiritual gifts to the body of Christ, Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 16. The least of these gifts was speaking in tongues, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28. In order for the church to get profit out of tongue talking, an interpreter had to be present, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 28 tells the tongue talker, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Then, a prophet needed to say if the word spoken was of the Lord or not. By contrast, a prophet could speak a direct word from the Lord without a tongue talker or an interpreter, which is why Paul said, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. This means that, as long as there were prophets in the church, the gifts of tongue talking and interpreting were useless. Yet. God gave these gifts because, during the time of spiritual gifts, every believer received a spiritual gift, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11, based upon their measure of faith, Romans 12 verse 3, i.e., how much sound doctrine they had built up in their inner man.
At the end of Acts, God no longer had Paul go to the Jews with the gospel, which is why Acts ends where it does. God also ended the spiritual gifts at this time since God's word was completed. Therefore, the two reasons for continuing spiritual gifts in the dispensation of grace had come to an end. This means that tongues ceased, as prophesied in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8. Nevertheless, tongues are accepted among Pentecostals today. This is because, one, it is the easiest gift to fake, and two, it gives a person the opportunity to use the flesh while still appearing to be spiritual. Therefore, they have the Kundalini awakened and claim that tongues are from God, or they simply fake the tongue talking so they can continue their blissful ignorance without ever having to read and believe God's word. This book has been written to expose tongue talking today as not being of God but being of the flesh. It is important for all Christians to understand this. Otherwise, they will look to the flesh to try to accomplish the things of the Spirit. This will result in people becoming stagnant in their spiritual growth as they seek the things of the flesh rather than reading and believing God's word in order to grow in sound doctrine and live the in Christ life. Resistance by tongue talkers to this shows that they would rather stay in the flesh with a form of godliness than to pursue true godliness by living by the faith of the, of the truth in this area. Resistance by tongue talkers to this shows that they would rather stay in the flesh with a form of godliness than to pursue true godliness by living by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2 verse 20. My prayer is that all Christians would come unto the knowledge of the truth in this area, accomplishing God's will in their lives. 2 Timothy 2 verse 4.